think when I was 15 years old, I had a dream of coming to Mongolia. And I can't imagine 10 years later, I'm here and actually with a purpose rather than just traveling. So my topic right now is recycling education technology. And most of you will think recycling is used with waste. Now what is this guy talking about recycling education? I'll get to that slowly as we go through the talk, but I'll give you some background on why I had this idea uh, and why I'm here. It was around a year ago, me and my friend Alela sitting down at Cisco in Silicon Valley. You know, we have our skill sets and we are engineers and we realized we're not really making an impact. Uh, yeah, we have a comfortable life, but there's this whole world outside, uh, especially orphanages, who could benefit so much from just our services. So we came up with the idea, why not use education and try and take it to orphanages around the world? So our starting point was education that works great in the developed world. We have Khan Academy, and I totally love Sal who's been talking on TED for so many years, CK12, open education resources. And you have more and more people focusing and developing education technology in the developed world. But the need is more in developing countries. But none of them are reaching there. So we said, let's take this and take it to orphanages and make it accessible. Let them just reuse it. Let them recycle and reuse this education resources that we have. So all right, great idea. How do we go about it? No one has money. I didn't have money. Lela didn't have money. So we said, let's start emailing orphanages and finding out if they are interested in this idea. I mailed around 1,000 orphanages over one year, got 60 responses. That's like 6%. And in the corporate world, that's considered a recipe for disaster. But we tried to look at it in a different aspect. 60 orphanages, that means at least 60 children who we could impact with some education. And the maximum limit, it's unlimited. So we said, let's, let's take a chance, let's go and start with our project. So we had these resources on our backup. We said, let's go and go to the orphanage. Why is it not working? Can anyone guess what this picture is? It's a lot of spider webs in a computer. Um, this is the case in most developing countries. We have one part of the technology which was at some point donated either to orphanages or to schools, but no one's using it. It's become a waste. And that's when we realized you have education and technology because started off as a need and a basic necessity, but now it's turning out to become a waste for people who actually need it. So let's do something about it. I used the kids in the orphanage, use the education content that we had, and five days later we had everyone using all the computers for accessing education material. And that, by the way, is Khan Academy, and these kids really loved it. So I said, all right, this worked in Indonesia, and I was really inspired by Didi and Lotus. I've been following them for a couple of years. So I said, let me go to Mongolia, because I've heard of orphanages there, and maybe I can take this technology, this education resource, and help them out. So we came, I came here to do this, and while I was in this process, I started realizing that it's not just orphanages, but Mongolia has, over the past years, been given so many resources, which is spread, spread across all over the country, but it's not being used. I went, visited schools in small homes and IMAGs around the country. Yeah, you have internet, but can you really use it for education? And behind all of this, I realized there's a small problem. It's as we develop education technology in America or in Europe, 
we are so focused on building the next best thing without realizing, will that really work in developing countries? All our technology and all the applications that people solve or build for solving education are based on the cloud. And sometimes, it's not the cloud, it's the pigeons which work. Sending a small CD to a small Zoom in Mongolia with education content is more practical and addresses the education issue at this moment rather than waiting for a cloud-based solution 10 years in the future. Because trust me, no matter where I've visited in developing countries, the only cloud they see is the one in the sky, and it has nothing in it. So we decided to keep it simple, and the idea was, all right, let's recycle. Let's take everything that's on the cloud in developed countries, Khan Academy, MIT, you know, you have two million textbooks which are free. You have tons of library resources that are accessible to people in those countries. And let's find a way, a very innovative way, to make it accessible to developed countries now, developing countries. So we took that, a slice of the internet, and created something called education hotspots. The first hotspot set up in Indonesia in an orphanage. And what a hotspot really is, is a local intranet. It's actually 20 years outdated. It existed before the internet came into being. But that actually works more effectively in these places. So these hotspots, which are in a remote town anywhere in the country, as long as it has electricity, contains all these education materials. Videos, you can put vocational training, you can put health training, you can put, I mean, all the, it has a lot of potential. So we started setting it up, and in Mongolia, over the next two months, we decided to set it up in over 30 locations around the country, which will never get internet access in the next three to five years. But there was an inevitable problem in this, the language barrier that we face. Most of this is in English, and might be relevant in America or English-speaking countries. But the same idea, if put in a Mongolian or an Indonesian context, can start becoming relevant there. Now, I had a challenge. How do I get people to start working on this content in Mongolia? I can approach teachers, I can approach volunteers, but they already are burdened with enough coursework, so no one has time to do or help out. So it made me realize who are the real stakeholders in education sector? Maybe the teachers, maybe the Ministry of Education, but the real stakeholders are children. I mean, they are the future. They are the ones who we tell, you learn this way, you learn this, and that's how they proceed with their life. So why not use children to create the content. <clears throat> so what we started over the last two months that have been here is taking children, maybe 12-year-old, 13-year-old children from, actually some from the orphanage, some from high school, really smart kids, Mongolian kids who are the future, and said, here's a lesson that works great in America. Can you create it in the Mongolian context? And surprisingly, over the last two months, we have over 200 lessons already created in Mongolian. Now, what that means is, with all of these hotspots that we set up around the country, you can have material created by these children shared with every kid around the country. And that's a great empowerment for these children. So what we've done with this platform is enable the youth and the future of Mongolia by facilitating them to actually contribute. It can be maybe a song, maybe a musical lesson, but something that can actually reach the far corners of Mongolia, which is not possible. So we facilitated them to actually contribute. We taught them how to teach and rather than us teaching them, they are now empowered to teach small lessons. Zaya, who actually is from Lotus, is a 15-year-old orphan, and 
she has created 100 classes. She's now almost become an expert that if I give her a computer and say, can you teach math? And she sits down and can create a 10-minute class on mathematics. Now, that's really special because this kid didn't have the opportunity or did not even know that she could actually do this. So now she can teach. The next thing is learning. I remember as a kid, my teacher telling me that what she enjoys most about her profession, about teaching, is learning, that she gets to learn something new. So now if you make the youth and children of this country actually start teaching, imagine how much more they can learn. And start doing this at a young age. And with learning and teaching, what you're inculcating in them is the value of sharing. Because now a child in UB can share her or his lesson with the rest of the country. I'm going to end this with some pictures that we have. That's Zaya up there who is 15 years old and who's done all these lessons. Here's Odgo. She's from another orphanage in UB, actually, and did not know that she had the ability to actually teach or create something. But in two hours, she actually translated Khan Academy into Mongolian, the entire interface, which, by the way, is going to run in multiple places in this country. So as we're talking about designing the future for Mongolia, these kids are the future of the country. And what is most key for them is that they have some social values built into them. And through this platform, with Mongolians on board, we can actually truly empower them with social values, teaching, and education. Thanks.